Okay. Um, thanks everybody for coming to our talk today. I'm pleased to welcome you to For Love or Money, What Researchers Should Know About Academic Data Cartels, a talk with Sarah Landon to celebrate Inter International Love Data Week. I'm Thea Lindquist, your host, coming to you from the University of Colorado at Boulder and the Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Asset Innovation Incubator Inclusive Data Science Team, the Department of Information, and the LEED School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. We'll start out with a quick rundown about how things will work during this webinar. Dr. Lambden will speak for about 40 minutes. Um, and if you have any questions for her, please put them into the Q&A function. This talk is being recorded, but we'll stop recording for the Q&A portion of the session. Please be aware that your name will be visible to other attendees in the Q&A, though there is an option to pose anonymous questions there. On social media, please use Love Data Week hashtag that's listed on the slide. To kick off, Robert McDonald, Dean of Libraries and Senior Vice Provost of Online Education, will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Thea. Uh, I'm really uh, proud and privileged today to introduce our speaker, Sarah Lambden, who's a professor of law at the CUNY School of Law in Queens, who specializes in information law. Her research and advocacy span the spectrum from public information access to personal data privacy. Sarah is also a law librarian with a master's degree in library and information science. When she's not teaching, she works with organizations like Spark, where she's a senior fellow, NYU's Engelberg Center on Information Law and Policy, and other open access and data privacy advocacy groups. We're really privileged to have Sarah with us this week for Love Data Week 2023 at the University of Colorado Boulder. And we're so glad that all of you could join us today virtually for this keynote for the celebration of the week. I also wanted to point out Professor Landman's, um, uh, Lambden's new book, Data Cartels, the companies that control and monopolize our information. And I've just started reading it and I thoroughly love it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm really grateful to everyone who made this possible. I know there's a lot of organizing involved in these types of events. Also, I am currently in my 12 year old son's room. So um, I apologize for the background or I celebrate the background, which is definitely um, the background of a, a 12 year old. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, as, as Thea said, the format for today is I'm going to give a little overview of kind of what my what I've learned in my research and how it impacts us in academia and people who work with academic resources and also maybe data It might be interesting from that standpoint as well. And then we will hopefully get to have a conversation um, after that. I also want to point out so I've noticed um, there, there's a really great turnout and I see a lot of people that I really admire from the um, digital humanities world, the copyright world, et cetera. I just wanna clarify from the start, I'm a librarian and a, an information expert. I'm not, um, I'm not like a, a tech expert. So I, um, I, I, I like don't know how to code very well and things like that. So if I say anything incorrect in regards to kind of intricacies of like algorithms and um, and those kind of like machine learning processes, I apologize in advance. But I promise I am an expert at um, at information science. <laughs> and so um, um, take this journey with me from that perspective. <laughs> OK. With that, I'm gonna do that awkward thing that we do where we uh, share our slides. And as I do that, I'm gonna make sure everybody can hear me okay. We're good with that. Cool. Okay, so hearing no complaints, I'm going to assume that you all can hear me. And um, I'm going to, great. I'm going to start my slideshow here from the beginning. Okay, so as Robert mentioned, the topic of, of our discussion today is um, 
a, is, is a book that I recently published. It came out in November from Stanford University Press. And the book really encapsulates um, five years of research. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of go into the background of that research. And I'll also, um, I'll also go ahead and um, tell you kind of what the implications of that research are for us. And I'm also going to, I've been trying not, I used to print out like a paper copy of my slides, which is a big waste of paper. So I've been trying lately to just kind of follow along on my phone, um, which I'm going to arrange now. <laughs> All right, perfect. We are, we are ready to go. Okay. So first I'm gonna explain how I came to this topic. And the topic is what does it mean for us kind of, I'm going to assume that a lot of us are in academia, a lot of us are in library science or we work in data, data, field, um, data related fields. Um, or we might be um, legal experts because I also, my background, I'm a law professor and I am also a librarian. So I'll explain that in a minute. But I want us to think as we kind of go through the process of, of listening to this background about the implications on academic and intellectual freedom um, when our academic resource providers, so our research providers, um, our search platforms are kind of are everything that's wrapped up honestly with Elsevier and uh, ProQuest and Clarivate, these, these tools that we use to manage our workflows, to report progress on our grants, um, to do research. What does it mean when those companies are being run by data or when those resources are being run by data analytics companies? Because that's really the gist of everything that I'm about to describe. So <laughs> what does this even mean, right? That's the first question. What am I even talking about when I say Elsevier is now a data analytics company or ProQuest, which is our library management system, ProQuest is now an information um, company. So uh, I'm going to explain how I learned this and what I think it means, which you know may or may not be the case. I am open. I am open to other opinions um, and and perspectives on this. But the reason I decided to write the book Data Cartels was that in 2017 I was a law librarian at a public law school in New York City. In fact, uh, CUNY Law School is the only public law school in New York City. And our mission is actually to diversify the legal profession, one of our missions, in New York City, which means that many of my students are first generation law students and immigrants, and they um, come from communities that are um, that consist mostly of different immigrant groups. Like we are located in Queens, which has um, the, the greatest variety in language and dialects in the whole world. So we are a community of immigrants. And in 2017, I was a law librarian and I was teaching hundreds of law students how to do legal research, which is a key part of practicing law. And the main tools I used to do this were Westlaw and Lexis. Westlaw and Lexis are a legal information duopoly. If you are in law school or if you are a librarian who does any legal research, you are likely doing that research on Westlaw and Lexis. They own the wealth of legal information, the vast majority of legal information in the United States. They publish some states' laws, their case law and their statutes. They are the primary publisher. They're the only place to get certain laws in the United States. And so I spent most of my days in a world of Westlaw and Lexis. Like my job, sometimes I felt was kind of to just be a glorified Westlaw or Lexis representative, right? I, it, was, it was a key part of my work. And that was fine, right? They're great products. They work really well. Anybody who uses them can see how, how helpful they are um, if you're a legal practitioner or a legal researcher. But in 2017, I got a hold of, of, of the news article you see on the screen. 
And the article is called, it says, these are the technology firms lining up to build Trump's extreme vetting program. Because um, if, if we get in the time machine and go back to 2017, we, write, we might remember that ICE was coming under a lot of scrutiny, public scrutiny for its practices in 2017 and um, the, its child separation practices, the way it was detaining children in cage-like structures. And also this extreme vetting program, which was meant to be one of the largest digital surveillance programs in the United States. So Trump had ordered um, DHS and ICE to start building this, this very intensive, invasive data surveillance system. And ICE went out to find data providers, right? And these two reporters, Sam Biddle and Spencer Woodman, who are tech reporters who write a lot about data, they FOIA'd, they, they did a freedom of information request and obtained the list of people who were attending these ICE, um, ICE information days that, that where ICE would like explain these products um, and what they were trying to build to vendors and vendors would then buy to help build those contracts or build those products by, you know, bidding, going through the bidding process, the government contracts bidding process. So I was really surprised to see among the list of attendees, um, representatives from Thomson Reuters Special Services and also from um, LexisNexis Special Services. So TRSS, it, that stands for Thomson Reuters Special Services and LNSSI, those are LexisNexis employees. And the reason that that surprised me is Thomson Reuters is the parent company for Westlaw and LexisNexis is the parent company for the legal product Lexis. And that really concerned me um, as a librarian because I knew um, I, I, it had never occurred to me that Westlaw and Lexis could be involved in government surveillance programs. I only knew those companies as publishers and I only knew those companies specifically as legal publishers. So at first I couldn't even figure out why, why um, these companies would be involved with um, would be involved with with this type of program. I was like, what are they going to do? Are they going to use like case? Are they going to run case law through Palantir to do predictive policing? I had no idea, right? But it concerned me, and I, I wanted to know more. So I went ahead, and um, a colleague and I, another librarian, we wrote a blog post. And we wrote it for the American Association of Law Libraries blog. We'd both been, I've been, I'd been a member of the American Association of Law Libraries since 2003 for over a decade. Um, and that was known as the organization where library professionals and law library professionals could talk, right? Like that was the main meeting place for professionals in the law library profession for legal research experts. So my colleague and I, we didn't think it was controversial at all. We drafted just a simple blog post saying, hey, we just noticed this news article. Does this, should we be concerned about this? Like, what is this? And what does it mean for legal research, right? And the blog post went up and within two minutes, the American Association of Law Libraries removed the blog post. And they said they did it at the advice of AALL general counsel. Here's where, this, this is what the page looks like if you go to it today. Um, and that really shocked me because librarians are not usually into censorship. We're usually, we usually, you know, prize transparency. And honestly, it, it pissed me off, you know, as a librarian who was spending thousands of dollars and my, my organ, you know, my professional organization um, cumulatively throughout my career, I wanted to be able to ask these questions and, and I found that I couldn't. Honestly, if this blog post had just stayed up, I probably never would have done any more research and I would have just kind of assumed that law librarianship would take care of it and we would move on because I wasn't looking to change my job. I wasn't looking to be in the center of any controversy. I just, I, I was just concerned about this one thing. But once they took the blog post down and I realized that this, wouldn't be something we could talk about. I became very curious and I started looking into what Westlaw and Lexis were really about and what Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis were really about. And the more I found, the more surprised I was. 
Um, and I realized that if I, as a law librarian who felt myself, you know, I thought I was pretty savvy. Like if I didn't know anything about these companies, probably none of my library colleagues knew about them either. And the more I researched, the more I realized that there was a lot that I think we should know as academics, as librarians, as lawyers. So I wrote the book really just to lay out the landscape of what these companies do. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of pivot and I'm gonna tell you what these companies do and what they're about. Cause I think we think of Lexus and Westlaw and Elsevier um, and other products that these companies make Reuters, right? I think we think of these entities as publishers. Um, and that makes sense because up until about a decade ago, they were publishers. That was their primary role. But in the last decade or so, as kind of data analytics and data brokering has become more of a common thing and data, personal data has become more valuable and personal data products have become more valuable. And as the publishing industry is beginning to decline and change, um, these traditional publishers have been pivoting, they've been changing their business and they have been moving towards becoming data analytics companies. In fact, um, in I think around like 2018 or 2019, um, Relics was actually, read Elsevier LexisNexis, sorry. When I say Relics, I'm talking about LexisNexis is like big umbrella of companies, which includes Elsevier, Lexis Law, LexisNexis data products. Um, when Reed Elsevier, uh, or in 2018 or 2019, Reed Elsevier was actually recategorized um, from being a media company to being a business solutions company. So, so they were actually, I think it was like Stanley Morgan's um, MSCI or Morgan Stanley, sorry, I'm terrible at acronyms. Morgan Stanley actually re recategorized them from media company, so a company that creates you know, publications to a business solutions company, which is an enterprise that does analysis that you know, makes predictions and prescriptions that help businesses assess risk and stuff. And that, that's an entirely different type of business, right? So this pivot isn't something I'm making up. It's something that Reed Elsevier, LexisNexis and, and Thomson Reuters are proud of and that they openly admit, right? That's not like, that's not a question. It's not a question that they don't consider themselves publishers anymore. It's a fact. And you can see it when you look at how they describe themselves. So here is kind of an here are some snippets of how these companies describe themselves. So today, Reed Elsevier Lexis Nexus calls itself a global provider of information-based analytics and decision tools for professionals and business customers, enabling them to make better decisions get better results and be more productive. So you think Elsevier is a journal publisher, but read Elsevier LexisNexis calls itself a business solutions provider, right? Similarly, if you look at West, the way Westlaw describes itself in part, it is a litigation analytics um, provider. It provides actionable data to improve your strategy and that's geared towards you know, lawyers and legal professionals. Clarivate, which owns now um, Web of Science and our and ProQuest, our major library information services provide um, digital services system um, that the most academic institutions and research institutions use, considered itself a global le leader in providing trusted insights and analytics. It used to bill itself as an index for finding information about science publications, but that's not how it, it now. It prides itself in being an, an, um, a company that provides predictions to um, predictions to tech companies, pharmaceutical companies about you know kind of what kind of science is coming down the pipe based on our academic labor. And um, Bloomberg, which is uh, I talk about Bloomberg in my book, um, it's it's a major financial information provider, and it also is you know it's I don't think it's ever considered itself anything but an analytics company. I don't think there's much of a pivot there, but also financial information providers are um, are also data and more and more looking to kind of increase their profits and you know build up their business model around giving prescriptions and predictions about how how financial, you know, financial markets will fare in the future, how different industries will fare in the future. So data analytics is a big business, not just in publishing, right? These publishers have followed the trend of other types of industries, right? Every industry now in essence is, is a data, is a, is a data analytics 
ent enterprise, right? They all use, you know, personal data that they either gather through their products, through, you know, the internet of things, the, the, the products that they sell, or they get data from third-party sources, from data brokers to enrich their products, enrich their ability to be able to sell us products, right? So here are just a few examples. Um, our thermometers, right, uh, that we, we use a lot, especially over the last few years, they are now collecting our data to predict, you know, how illnesses are spreading across the country, where is the flu prevalent, you know, um, where is COVID going next? Your car collects data about you and can sell it to insurance companies to assess, you know, how much, how risky of a driver you are, how, how much of an insurance risk you are. Um, your refrigerator can, um, gives data back to the you know manufacturer the company or to advertisers to to anybody who is interested in in how you're using food how much you're using food etc and there's even smart clothing right i mean i bet a lot of us right now are wearing like apple watches or fitbits those are data collection devices too they're making your life better by helping you track your exercise or look at your heart rate but they're also improving third party sources and um, industries, data collections, right? So to go back to publishing, this is actually, I got this chart originally from uh, a Clarivate, an, uh, one of Clarivate's 10K, so an annual report that Clarivate filed, but this isn't unique to Clarivate. Like you can look up this pyramid it, it, in different iterations is, is all over the place. I didn't, I didn't make this up, but it, it is, like it is the business model that Reed Elsevier, Lexis, Nexus, Clarivate, Thomson Reuters are following and, and are building towards. It, this is their goal. This is how they see themselves. So it used to be in paper form that these companies would profit at the point of sale. They would pub. They would make. They would make a publication. Right. They would compile all of case law or compile a, an academic journal, and then a library or an individual would buy it from them, right? And that, that was how they made their money. They would sell kind of information as a service that, that they were publishers. But the internet and the ability to collect personal data um, opened up more opportunities for these companies to diversify their consumer bases and also their, their business. So in the 90s, when we, when we were, when we got the gift of the internet, and also when we when we had a lot of growth in kind of how how database technology worked and how we could connect things and run searches through databases, um, which a lot of us who've been librarians since the early aughts uh, got to see firsthand. Right, we've gotten to see how much database searches have improved. We've gone from Boolean searches to natural language searches. Right, and those types of advancements offered these companies the ability to make really robust platforms and workflow tools, right? Like Interfolio is a tool that Elsevier just bought, but it's also the tool where most academic institutions collect our resumes for, for job applications and our letters of recommendation. And then they can use these documents about us to track us through our professional lives and you know maybe put together our tenure files, right? So these workflow tools that really run run through academia and, and kind of and connect to our publications, right? Which is a business they're already in. So this is that middle layer, right? Like when you look at a Westlaw or Science Direct or um, even like a, a Clarivate impact factor assessing tool, right? They can sell organized data, smart data, um, and they can also sell really complex research platforms and other workflow tools, you know, like citators that tell us if a case is still good law or, you know, the way they assign head notes or even like metadata tags to group different types of articles together to save, save articles that you might be interested in for you or show them to you, you know, in, in a personalized file for you. So they, they started selling those types of tools, which were also very helpful to academics. Um, and then they got into the personal data business as well. Um, in the 90s, both Reed Elsevier, Lexis, Nexus, and Thomson Reuters became major data brokers. And bought a lot of public records companies like ChoicePoint um, and Accurant, Sizent, and they started selling predictive analytics that predict what we might do as a future, or in the future. So are we risky? Might we commit a crime? Might we make some really good research that will be really lucrative for an academic institution, right? 
And then they also started making prescriptive tools that advise, you know, that tell people what to do financially or what your institution should do with hiring decisions. And those, that top of the pyramid is really, really valuable because that is original information that these companies can only make because they have a wealth of information and data, right? It's this, it's like this magic crystal ball that these companies have, and they only have it because they have so much personal data and then so much academic data and so much legal data and so much news information that they can make really complex decision, you know, decision-making tools and assessment tools, right? So that's really as as the the you know, the, the print publication industry kind of collapses into itself and, and we, we are able to find more things online through, you know, Google Scholar or what have you. Really these companies in order to stay afloat, right? It's not even, it's, it, it is a business decision, right? They have to diversify and change what they are doing. And that top of the pyramid is probably the most lucrative, valuable thing that they can do, right? But it also has some downsides that we'll discuss in a minute. First, I want to show you why these companies can build such robust um, analytics tools. It is because they are duopolies, monopolies, oligopolies in all of these information sectors. So um, they are legal information duopoly, which is where I started my adventure. Westlawn Lexis, you, it's really tough to compete with them. They have more legal information than any of their competitors. Elsevier, which is a Reed Elsevier Lexis Nexus product is part of a small oligopoly of publishers that have the lion's share of academic information. And Elsevier also collects a lot of information about academics. They have Scopus, they have Pure, they have all of our preprint services, SSRN and BPress. So they have problem. I mean, now they have Interfolio. They have more academic information about us than probably any other third-party private source in the world, I would say. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I, I am saying that based on my research, so I could be wrong, but I really, I can't imagine another business that has more information about academia, academics, what, what different institutions, humans, and, um, and publications are providing. I, I find another source that is as robust, right? Um, and then they also have huge news, news archives and news collections. So Thomson Reuters has its own news, you know, news agency and nexus actually started as one of the biggest news archives in the world and it still says that it is right like if you ever did debate um in high school you use lexus nexus all the time right it is a huge huge um, mountain of news information they also have a huge amount of financial information they have they um get all all of the data scraped from sec filings and other um and other types of financial information that can really help them predict how markets will, you know, perform and what is going on in various industries. Finally, this is what surprised me, right? Like this is what I didn't know. And this is what really, I think it's kind of the creepiest part of their business. And I'm not, we're, we're also not sure if this part of their business is isolated to just the, the, the little triangle. They also happen to be gigantic data brokers. They are the two of the largest, if not the largest data brokers for the US government. Um, they serve um, most of the S&P 500 um, corporations. They serve a, like LexisNexis says it serves 70 to 80% of US federal, state and local agencies, including thousands of law enforcement agencies and ICE, right? The first, like the tip of the iceberg that was poking out of the water, that, that was the first thing that was reported on was ICE, right? And that's what we tend to focus on because it is so shocking. But these companies work with thousands of law enforcement agencies and child protective service agencies and social security agencies and the IRS um, and your insurance company and your bank and your healthcare system. So it's not just law enforcement um, and it's not just ICE. And I'll talk a little bit about that, that how that data brokering model works in a minute, um, hopefully if I if I get to it. But um, I want to show you, these are the type of academic vendors I'm talking about. You, you recognize these, you've used these, you've seen these. These are all part of this system. And 
Um, I talk about Reed Elsevier LexisNexis a lot because it is by far the largest. And I will show you why in the next slide. It is a sprawling information giant. These are all Reed Elsevier LexisNexis companies. Is that surprising or is it not surprising? I think it's a little bit surprising, right? And this isn't even like an exhaustive list of all of the companies that are under their, their corporate umbrella, but it is huge, right? There are many companies and resources that you use every day that are right here, right? A lot of people are surprised when they learn that SSRN and B Press are Read Elsevier Lexus Nexus because they think, well, I'm posting my preprints online and that's open, right? That's a separate system. It's not a separate system because the company, Reed Elsevier LexisNexis has purchased both of the smaller companies. In fact, librarians are really familiar with the experience of falling in love with a new resource like Mendeley or B-Press and then having it swiped up by Reed Elsevier LexisNexis. Um, there are some really, really nice quotes that are in my book that I can't remember right now, but they compare, they compare Elsevier to, um, to people in, um, or to characters in Star Wars movies, not the good guys, um, unfortunately for Reed Elsevier, Alexis Nexus, but they just really absorb a lot of academic companies. Um, and even since I've been writing this book, one thing I do with Spark is um, every time there's a major acquisition, which happens so often, we, we will research it and report it and think about what the implications of it are because Read Elsevier LexisNexis is always acquiring new academic enterprises. Um, so how does this impact us? That's really what I wanna talk to you about, right? Like that's really why we're, we're here today. So these are kind of the risks I unearthed during my research. We have less privacy when we use these products. These products are associated with companies that are very interested in collecting personal data and that also are using personal data in the context of academia to build data analytics products to sell to our employers, um, whether that be an academic institution or um, a pharmaceutical company or technology company, they're making metrics and, and risk assessments about us and impact assessments about us that they are hoping will be interesting to people who want to give us jobs and give us grants, et cetera. Um, it also, we have less intellectual and academic freedom because if we use these products and these products have become like data vectors, that means that we're being tracked or as we, you know, when you log on to Science Direct or when you're on Lexis, you're using a password that is associated with your student ID and that is your name and whatever personal identifying information might be attached to it. And that information is traveling with you as you click on things, as you put things in, you know, your Science Direct file or whatever. Um, and that information is, you know, it becomes part of like your data dossier, like the, the, the data exhaust that travels after you um, and, and follows you around like dust, right? As you move about these systems, it's, it's just collecting. Um, we also have less control over academic assessment. A lot more of our academic opportunities are determined by these companies because the people who make decisions about our lives are more and more relying on these companies' metrics and data tools to assess us. And finally, we have less choice about what resources we use and we have less choice about what prices we pay for them, right? We, um, there's a huge open access movement around ensuring that we have um, accessible academic resources. And these companies are really good at erecting paywalls and erecting systems that makes it really hard for people to access our research and for us to access other people's research, right? So I, in, in the name, in, in, in the interest of making sure we have enough time to talk, I'm going to go through these slides really quickly. So how can a company like Relics pose these types of risks? Um, one is the data analytics, right? Um, data analytics is, and I'm thinking here specifically of academic data analytics, but they also do analytics that they sell to insurance companies, healthcare providers about us as well, and law enforcement, right? So data analytics is the pursuit of extracting meaning from raw data using specialized computer systems. These systems transform, organize, and model the data to draw conclusions and identify patterns. Like this is the core of Reed Elsevier, Lexis, Nexus's, and Thomson Reuters and Clarivate's business model, right? These companies that are huge companies that serve more and more of academia. This is really what they are doing, right? This is, this is their goal in academia and beyond. 
right? This is, this is their business model as I showed you earlier. So they can make really cool tools like COVID-19 projections, stock market predictions, right? I don't, I don't, I actually am not negative about data analytics, right? I'm not like a Luddite or who, who hates technology. I love technology. I think data analytics can be a very important and useful tool, but I do think we have to be critical and careful about who is creating them, what their motives are, and what, what their ingredients are, what their data ingredients and algorithmic ingredients are, right? Um, so these are just some examples of data analytics. And this is how these companies advertise themselves, right? Like it looks magical. It looks like this system that is miraculous will we'll spit out numbers and solutions at the click of a button, right? But in reality, this is how I think the businesses look. Like from what I've observed um, through my experience working in legal products and also through the research I've done uh, and, the, and the people I've met along the way that I, I've seen kind of what happens because of algorithmic biases and data biases, right? So it it's, it's marketed as this, but really, it is like a Play-Doh fun factory. And that is because um, the data that goes into these systems is not vetted or quality checked by these companies. So our personal data dossiers are not corrected, um, but they're getting data from over 10,000 sources about us in real time. And a lot of that data is wrong. And a lot of academic data is wrong, right? And it might not reflect the whole story of who we are as academics and who we are as humans. Um, and then also, the machine itself, right? The, the, the algorithms, machine learning systems, whatever you wanna call them, they are also biased. And there's a whole body of research on that. I'm going to give you names of experts on that work. So there's um, Sophia omoja Noble, there's Ruha Benjamin, there's Kathy O'Neill, there's Joy Bolowini. And these are all experts on different types of algorithmic and technological biases that are on like the coding technology side. Remember, I am not a technologist, so I encourage you to read their work because you will be stunned if you haven't already read their work by just the degree to which algorithms are biased and to which they embed systemic biases like, like racist biases and other types of biases into systems. And I cannot imagine that we have a system, an algorithmic system that assesses academics that is not infused with the same biases. I know that in the legal research world, um, Susan Neville Omar has done a lot of research on algorithmic biases in Westlaw and Lexis and found plenty just in her you know, non-technological research. So take that for what it is. And then also the data sets are biased. So what ends up happening is that the conclusions that these systems draw are not necessarily the conclusions we'd actually want academic institutions to use or law enforcement agencies or insurance companies, et cetera, right? And um, I always like to show this because I think that LexisNexis's own picture of its own model for how it does its algorithm or how it does its, its uh, data analytics process looks like the Plato Fun Factory, right? So on the on the on the left side of the screen, you see all the types of data that they feed through this magic algorithmic system to make these things on the other side, right? They take primary research, public records, which are personal data records, proprietary data, who knows what that is, news, contributory databases, legal databases, whatever they have, basically, whatever other databases they have, unstructured records. So just like, I don't know, floating floating bits of data. I have no idea what those records are. Structured records. And they run it through this magical thing in the middle, right? They decrease content volume and they increase content quality. However, they do that, right? And then they spit out products. Those products might be link analyses, clustering analyses, complex analyses, entity resolution, right? They give them all fancy but vague terms. The one thing I talk about in my book is how vague the terminology these companies uses to describe what they produce. And I suspect that's because if they said what they were actually producing, it would not look good, right? Oh, we're using your personal data to tell police whether to surveil you. We're using your we're using data about your healthcare characteristic to decide, you know, what kind of treatment a hospital should give you when you when you check in as an inpatient. Like these are not very great things to do. So they're given gauzy, uh, clever, vague names like link analysis, entity resolution, right? And that might be, I mean, honestly, it might be because what they're doing is so broad and so 
vast and big that they can't give more specific information, but I'm a cynic, so whatever. I ascribe the meaning, I ascribe to it. Um, you never get much specificity about, about how these um, results are being reached and what these results are actually being sold to companies to do and to the government to do. So yeah, they do all sorts of assessments. They do the usual platform and analytics where they sort and assess the content of digital files. So like when you do a search, certain things rise to the top, who they cluster people together in groups. They do impact assessments where they judge how much impact you might have. And they do risk assessments where they rank how risky we are, we might be. And they sell all of those products. I mean, those are valuable products. They're little, they're little crystal balls, right? How valuable is that to an insurance company to know how risky you might be? Um, so we don't know what data read Elsevier LexisNexis uses to do these analysis analyses. And believe me, I've spent years trying to find out. You cannot find a directory of their data input anywhere. But we do know that they use data from over 10,000 sources and they have over 78 billion um, per records of personal data. They have 283 million unique customer IDs that they call Lex IDs. You, everybody on this thing, you have a Lex ID. You have a data dossier that is huge and that is being updated in real time from over 10,000 sources of data. Your Lex ID probably knows more about you than you know about you. It knows everything about where you've ever lived, what licenses you've had, um, people you've interacted with, employment, any anything that they can get data about, um, including social media, is all combined in your data dossier. Uh, and we don't know what those 10,000 sources are. But here are some of the things they do with your data dossier. Um, they deliver, <laughs> they can link you to other people. They can sort you into lists by characteristics. They can identify you even if you don't want to be identified based on a very few little bits of data, like maybe part of your social security number and your last name. You know, just two, two or three little bits of data can re-identify you even if data has been de-identified. They can place you on a map. They can use visualization tools to link you to others, you know, visually. Um, and they can also give information alerts and notifications to any of their clients anytime your data changes. So if you're pulled over as you're driving home from work, ding, that data can be just sent immediately to your insurance provider, right, through them. And it's not that that couldn't happen through any other system, but these are things that, you know, LexisNexis is now one of the main providers of. So it's pretty creepy. I'm gonna end by just showing you some of the other industries besides our industry, besides the academic industry that these companies work with. They work with um, law enforcement. They have a virtual crime center that um, is selling tons of our data to the government and allowing law enforcement agencies to just pool all of their data together. Um, so yeah, it, that, that's something. Um, all, all without government regulation, right? Like all outside of the same regulations that apply to like NSA data fusion centers or whatever. That th Those rules don't apply to these third party fusion centers. Um, they also serve other government agencies, the IRS, Social Security Administration, your, you know, Child Welfare Administration. Um, and they sell uh, tenant screening data to landlords. And that creates like virtual blacklists that erroneously prevent some people from getting housing. They sell your data to healthcare systems and insurers to determine your healthcare um, trajectory and how much your healthcare insurance costs. And um, they sell data to uh, banks and other institutions that make big decisions about your life, like whether you can access your own bank account. And if your data, gets mixed up with someone else's data, which happens to a lot of people, people who have siblings, people who have common names, your data dossier probably contains other people's data. So if that other person overdraws their bank account, there is a chance that you could be locked out of your bank account. Um, and that is what this article is about. It, it's called, when LexisNexis makes a mistake, you pay for it. And it interviews people who have been in those types of situations because of LexisNexis's data products. Um, so one question that I get a lot is where do our where does our research go as academics? We aren't sure because there is no obligation for LexisNexis or, or Thomson Reuters or any other company to tell us. They don't have to tell us what they're doing with our data and they don't. But 
some people who do data research who are the tech experts that I am not have found indications that our data is being collected a lot through these products. Um, here's one example, uh, Wolfie Crystal, who is a data broker researcher, um, who is much better at technology than I am, found that um, Science Direct has threat metrics embedded in it, which is a surveillance data tool that is usually used by like law enforcement and other entities like that. So read Elsevier Lexis Nexus claims that it is trying to, you know, watch over its copyright, um, copyright assets. You make sure that nobody is illegally downloading things, but we don't know what they're actually using the data that gets collected through threat metrics for. They don't have to tell us. Nobody has to tell us, right? So who knows? Um, uh, but we do know that we have to use their platforms and we have to log on to their services without knowing how our data is being used. Um, and also, incidentally, I have tried and other people have tried for years to get these companies to issue a public statement promising that they aren't going to use research data in their policing data products. And they have never affirmatively published any sort of affirmation that they do not do that and that they will never do that. So if you work with a Lexus rep or a Thompson Reuters rep, you could ask them, hey, can you like promise me in writing that you're not gonna do that and see what they say. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is they also never expunge our data. They never throw our data out. And our data is sitting like a valuable resource in their systems. I compare it to like a vault full of gold, right? Data is valuable. Our data is there for them. And we don't know what they're doing with it, but we do know they probably are not getting rid of it ever. So they have it. Um, and this, this is a last little thing. This is, this is just me being petty. Um, so in when, when I started writing about this and talking about this, people were interested in especially immigration organizations, especially like this one group called No Tech for ICE that does a really good job of unraveling that immigration surveillance system that I was talking about in the beginning. And some law faculty question, you know, they, they asked Lexis, their LexisNexis representatives, hey, what's going on with this? So in, I think it was what, 2019, um, every law faculty in the whole country got this email. And it is a promise from LexisNexis that they were not, they were not working with ICE. They said, we aren't providing these kind of data services for ICE to ICE. Everybody's lying. This is baloney. And they even, they indicate that like there's another company that's doing that work, but it's not us. However, in 20, um, 2020, LexisNexis was able to undercut Thomson Reuters, who was ICE's biggest uh, data broker at the time. And now LexisNexis is ICE's main data broker, and they have a $16.8 million, I think, or 18.6, I forget which, I, but one of those two numbers. They have a multi-million dollar contract with ICE, and they are ICE's primary data broker and data provider. So yeah, that is the summary of what I have learned through my research, and I'm happy to take questions and, and have a discussion with you about that. Hey, thanks so much um, to Dr. Landon for a really fascinating and eye-opening presentation and at times a terrifying one. Um, we have about nine